the next is going to be a discussion section and um, it's titled how much has land rights and tenure insecurity impacted your country this is going to be for 20 minutes and um, we'll be having Kate, Kate Pele from the Land Equity International to take up this section. Hi Kate, how are you there? Hi, thank you David for the introduction. Thank you to the team for organizing so far. And um, special thanks to Justice just now. That was a fantastic presentation. And I think you might've um, covered a lot of what I think some of the, the people in this group were gonna discuss about, but um, we'll draw on that hopefully as we go through. Um, so I'm Kate Fairley. I am based in Australia, but I've lived in a number of countries around the world and um, I'm working with Land Equity International. We do land administration projects um, predominantly through Africa, Asia and the Pacific. Um, we have projects at the moment in Indonesia and the Mekong um, and we're working in this space that Justice has just been talking about, um, but also working directly with communities on land policy. Um, so I'm not, I don't wanna to go too much about me. You can Google it and whatever. I'm, I recognize a lot of you. Thanks for all the shout outs. Um, I've been involved with the FRG, I think for a bit over a decade now. So um, good to see so many familiar faces and a lot of new ones too. Um, I'm not presenting by myself, um, so I'm hoping that Rose from South Africa, Constance or Connie from Uganda, and Honey from the Philippines are around and, and ready to, to jump in. Um, the way this is going to work is that I've had some quick emails with Rose, Connie and Honey, and we they've sort of proposed some questions or some country um, or local contexts and they're gonna sort of briefly introduce those and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. Um, and we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion as much as we can have in about the 17 or so minutes we have remaining, but I'm hopeful this will get you thinking. I'm happy to, to have more of a chat after and obviously you'll be talking more in the later, later sessions. So um, maybe Rose, if you're there, if you could just start and just give a quick one minute or so um, introduction to yourself, your context, and the question that you want to discuss. Uh, hi, Kate. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Rose Guinea from South Africa. I'm based in Devon, but originally from the Eastern Cape, Nelson Mandela's province. Yes. The question that I was asking was, um, I'm not sure if it was a question or a comment, but it's about the disconnect between the uh, the technical experts and and the communities. So th that was my 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 my, um, my comment. It was on the disconnect between the technical expert and the communities. And uh, in in South Africa, this is um, I mean, how I would explain this for an example is just how I I, I am for an example unable to explain what I do to people. So if, if people from my community ask me, what do you do for a living? Uh, I demarcate boundaries, but uh, what is that exactly? What is boundaries in, in Costa? What is, you know, so, so I, I found that there's a gap in the vocab. So, so I, because I started surveying in English and uh -huh. I, I find it difficult to then translate the technical and, and the technical terms and make it easier for the general public to understand. And also there's a mistrust between the land surveyors or surveyors in general and the people in the communities. So people see surveyors and they think, um, yeah, they, 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 they see a threat for a lot of reasons, but that's basically an, uh, a, 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 a just an overall uh, comment that I had regarding the, the yeah no worries thanks Rose and I mean you sent me an email and you've gone into a lot of detail there I mean obviously um, I trust people know a little bit about the history of South Africa you know obviously with apartheid um, we know from what we've shared across Africa and a lot of you living across Africa um, sort of the customary land context um, the history of colonialism that's throughout there and all of these like historical factors will obviously have a role to play in what we do in land administration now, um, for better or for worse. Um, so I guess from your email to me and from a little of what you've said now, there's a few things to, to really pick up on. Um, and 
I guess, you know, to start off with, it's What trust. actions can increase the effectiveness? Oh, sorry. Oh, I think Connie, you've still got your microphone on. If you want to just turn it off for a second and I'll get back to you in about five minutes. Um, trust is really important. And um, that's sort of come out in, in previous discussions. Um, there's a lot of research being done at the moment about garnering trust from the community. Um, and we need to sort of take a step back and realize that it takes time to get trust. Um, we need to be listening to communities and we need to be really talking to them. Um, and we need to be thinking about who do they trust? And that came out in Justice's presentation about um, how do you bring the, the local elders on board, bringing in the, the youth to help with the mapping and local community members to actually do a lot of this. Um, and that's really important. Obviously communicating what we do is, is a component to that because we need to be recognized as trustworthy and recognized as having um, this position that the, the community should trust. Um, and I think you're right, um, Rose, when you say, you know, like if you if you promote yourself as just demarcating land, um, it's one not conveying everything that you're doing, but it can also generate a little bit of, of distrust. Um, and I see someone's put in geodetic engineer can be the name for the profession. I am really hesitant to talk about names. I think that we need to focus on meaning. And a lot of this comes down to us understanding as professionals what it is we're actually doing and why we are doing it. So when we talk about land administration, we are not just demarcating boundaries, we're not just taking measurements and mapping, but we there's underlying values to that. We are creating tenure security. Why is tenure security important? Well, there's a number of studies, and if you look at all the sustainable development goal stuff, you'll see that tenure security can promote nutritional values in children. It can um, promote education. It enables forest conservation. Um, it enables um, the welfare of women and the disadvantaged. It protects, it helps governments to provide services. It provides um, income flows so that there's a, a land market, which can be good and bad, um, but it can enable local councils to provide services to those who need it most, as well as to the population at large. So I guess if you think about that, then your communication being a land surveyor is listening and saying, okay, well, what do you need? Um, if you're in an informal settlement, do you feel like you can't leave your home? Do you feel like you can't travel because someone might claim it? Um, as a, a woman, do you feel like um, if your partner were to leave that you would be kicked out of home? Um, do you have access to electricity and water? Okay, how can we through tenure security, through land titling, through land documentation, help you to achieve those needs? And in some cases, land might not be at the crux of that, but in a lot of cases, it will be at least a component to the challenges that those communities are facing. So um, I guess I'd sort of, I definitely change my story as to what I am, depending on who I'm talking to. So it might be that I relate it to Google Maps to one person, but it, to someone else, I might relate it to, okay, buying a house is really easy in Australia, but it's really hard in other places. Um, or I might relate it to forest conservation or health depending on who I'm talking to. So unfortunately, there's no simple answer. Um, and I think you're all aware of that. But by continuing to, you know, read a lot and to understand um, how surveyors, geodetic engineers, professionals fit into this space, um, that is the beginning of your, of your story and your context of relating to other people. Um, so I might just pause and I'll hand, I'll move on to, um, maybe Constance next, and then hopefully there'll be a little bit of time at the end for anyone to have a comment, or uh, we might just have to continue the conversation offline. Um, so yes. Constance, do you want to go next? Yes. Hi, Kurt. Uh, Hi. Yes, I wanted to find out, uh, whereas we have the, the new innovations for S in, in form of STDM and fit for purpose, in Uganda we have... Um, we have a variant tenure system and they are still, there is still a bad mindset when it comes to accuracy, uh, low cost surveying, and the surveyors are wondering if we introduce the low cost tools, how are we going to earn from this? Uh -huh. And then uh, the accuracy issues recently that we have the LIS, the Land Information System, 
many recognizing uh, leasehold, freehold, and private mile tenure. Mm -hmm. But now, how are we going to have these new innovations for STDM and fit for purpose, merge with the rest for sustainability, so that they are going, they are effective. So yes. it's still puzzling me. Happen, <laughs> but then the good news, uh, maybe we we have we have pilot districts where they already they already taking on the new innovations, but that is now in the rural area. But in the city, in the urban areas, the effectiveness is not yet setting. So yeah. I'm wondering. Okay, I'm just going to jump in there so that we do have a little time to get to Rose. Really sorry to interrupt. Um, and I apologize to everyone if I am talking really quickly. I have a bad habit of doing that. I hope that you can still understand me and feel free to reach out to me afterwards if you've missed something. Um, so you had a couple of really interesting things there. And one is this conversation with professional Typically the white older male, or I guess in your case, not so white, but definitely older and really situated in the profession and they're not listening to what the latest innovations and news are coming out. And I mean, this we get this time and time again in every country, the profession is almost the last one to, to move. Um, one of the arguments we use in FIG a lot is that you need to bring people into the formal system so that then they will pay you and see the value in you in doing the work. Um, if they're outside the system, they're not using you anyway. Um, the second is thinking about this flow of money within surveying and land administration. Um, and one of the perplexing things for me is that typically in land administration, we focused on the rural areas and not on the urban. And this is for a number of reasons, including that the urban is really complex, but the urban is also really where the money is. Um, so in terms of getting um, runs on the board and getting formalization happening, um, the urban is where you can typically do that for a reasonable cost and in a way that will then both be self-financing for the surveyors and the government, so be revenue inducing, but also not super expensive for individuals because there's lots of people using like in a small area using the one land office and the you know the one set of facilities whereas rural areas people have to travel for hundreds of kilometers many hours um, or you've got a number of land offices that aren't financially viable so um, there's a yeah there's a really interesting thought to uh, thought process to go around when you're thinking about money um, and I guess in another reply to the older surveyors say, um, is that there's a number of prop tech um, property, like innovating startup firms that are moving into this space. Um, there's a really, I mean, spatial collectives obviously um, already in the space, but doing really well. Um, there's a company called Meridia, which is, um, they were not surveyors to start off with, but they're now working with, um, directly with both bigger companies like the sugar companies and cocoa companies and with farmers, oh, seasoned surveyors, sorry, John. <laughs> John is um, definitely excluded from my earlier criticism. Um, but Meridia is working directly with companies and directly with farmers to work out, okay, where is the money? What is the need? And how can we fulfill this in a way that is actually, if not, um, if not for profit, then I guess, profit or cost neutral. Um, I don't know to accept their full model, but I guess if you're thinking about who, who needs the property rights and why, and one of the, the reasons to have them are because large companies in mining, in um, natural resources like forestry, in cocoa, they want to acquire the land or at least a lease on the land to produce on it. Um, and often this happens through land grabbing or through concessions that may be legally or illegally, um, but typically not equitably um, granted by governments. Um, so how do you better enable farmers and farmer groups on the ground to um, have their rights um, in a way that the company is also contributing to that because they're the ones getting a lot of the value out of it. Um, same in urban areas. Like if you're thinking that there's going to be developments, who's going to profit from those developments and how can we harness that capital to then do land administration in a pro poor way? Um, the accuracy question, I think just has touched on a little bit, um, but it's, you know, we know about fit for purpose um, and we, we need as to professionals to sort of know about the, 
the latest technology and how it can be applied, but at the same time work out, okay, why do I need to know my boundary to a millimeter? And if you're thinking about granting rights to people that didn't have them previously, even if it's a three meter off, like all we need is a point. All they need is some sort of recognition that this is mine and then a legal um, backup to that to help enforce it. Um, so that's super quick there. I can see that someone has also written online about building trust and um, yeah, I can't emphasize that more. Um, I think as surveyors, we really have a responsibility to listen um, to communities, to gain their trust, listen to their problems and then articulate our offering in the language that um, communities themselves are using. Um, all right, so really, really quickly, I think we've got about three minutes left. Um, honey, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me clearly. I am yes. Hanelet Dagan, a genetic engineer under one of the local government units here in the Philippines. Uh, as you can see, uh, as you see, throughout the history of the Philippines, uh, various national agencies pushed for mass surveying and tightening programs. So now the people have different proofs of ownership or occupancy, such as titles, patents, etc. Uh, now, when conflicts arise, people are advised to consult different agencies and laws because sometimes both parties would have legitimate claim. It would be interesting to know the similarities and differences between the national land laws in terms of practice on the ground in different country contexts. Also, how? How can we, uh, the general surveyors of the public, aid further in such disputes and help lessen the mistakes unintentionally done by the people or the agencies in the past or in the present. Great. Thank you, Honey. So Honey um, comes from the Philippines, which, I mean, like many of your countries, um, has a very complex history. Um, I know there's a number of land institutions, both at national through to local levels. Um, there's a number of different land laws. There's, a, you know, in some cases, conflict between the land laws and conflict between the different institutions in terms of responsibilities. Um, and I think these came up as questions either for Ernst's presentation or, or Justice's presentation in, you know, we know in a lot of countries we need legal reform, we need institutional reform, but the reality is it's going to take a lot of time and it's going to cost a lot of money and it needs really strong political will to be successful. So in that kind of environment, what is our role as young surveyors? And I think in about a minute left, I have zero time to get into that. But um, I guess, again, it's about articulating um, what we do. Sharing experience is really important. And I think Honey alludes to that. And that's maybe a role that the VCSP could get in, in um, on board with. There is a lot of material on, on, online about doing it. But I guess I want to step back and just focus on Ultimately, the laws have to be put into practice. So it doesn't really matter what, I mean, it does, but whatever law you have, what the practice is on the ground is what is really important. And I guess as surveyors, we're in a position to tease out, is this law or policy operating in the way that we expect it to, or is it causing people to um, do behaviors that aren't conducive to our end goal? So an example from Cambodia is that surveyors went um, or the surveying policy was that you needed to clear the land in order to be, um, in order to have it recognized. So everyone cleared their land, which is not the goal that we want. Um, similarly, you might have a leak capture. So how do you, you know, our aim is equitable distribution of land, not that it'll suddenly be um, captured by the elite. Um, so I guess that's my, my thought to you guys. And just if I can have 30 seconds, David, to quickly put in some quick actions based on what we've talked about. I'm very happy for anyone to email me with their questions. But I think what we've sort of covered is that as young surveyors, we have a role to um, continue learning, um, to influence our um, senior surveyors or um, our, our um, other people working in the field, in the profession, in our, in our countries, um, to influence governments where possible and to um, speak to them about what the opportunities are and what the challenges are. Um, visiting communities and listening um, and working out how to articulate our needs in terms of um, our, our offerings in terms of their needs. Um, and then obviously a lot of the stuff that VCSP is already doing um, in turning online mapping, um, working out training. Um, another one that I think Rose or Honey had suggested was visiting schools and promoting the profession that way. Um, so I'll leave it there. Apologies if I've gone over time, but thank you to Rose, Constance and Honey for that um, input. 
apologies, it was less of a discussion than we wanted, but looking forward to the rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Kate. That was wonderful. Um, you've made us have something like a panel and a very interactive section. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, everybody who had participated in this section. And also thanks to those who are also um, using the chat box. We've seen a lot of communications. And um, I know we're learning and we don't have equal uh, ways of handling ma land matters. And um, I don't think in any way it can be uniform because there is need to respect culture, tradition, and history of every land, every country, and everywhere we find ourselves a part of the world. So thank you very much. It's very, very interesting. I hope